Hello everyone, welcome to TSAM Digital. My name is Amy and today I'm joined by Dr. Vian Sharif, who's Head of Sustainability at FNZ Group and Founder at Nature Alpha. So welcome Vian, it's great to have you. Thanks Amy, a real pleasure to be here. Amazing. Okay, so today we're just going to talk about a few things like technology and what you're doing in your work. But just to set the scene, could you just tell us a little bit about your background or your different areas of expertise? Sure. Uh, so, as I always say, I'm a double agent because really at heart, I'm a conservationist. Um, and that was a journey that began as a result of my work at Investec Asset Management, who spent a long, a lot of time looking at emerging markets and emerging markets investments. And so in very early part of my career, I ended up traveling to amazing places in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and being part of the most incredible natural landscapes. And so I took that on into my work uh, within the asset management industry and did that alongside my PhD. D, um, where I focus on environmental behavior change. And then uh, I decided to dedicate myself 100% to sustainable investing and sustainable finance. And that's how I uh, found my way into the team here at FNZ. And alongside that, founded Nature Alpha, which is uh, a, a digital uh, analysis platform for giving investors insight into their impact on nature and biodiversity, which, as we know, is one of the most uh, fast accelerating areas of, uh, of knowledge that investors are seeking, given the regulatory developments in this space. That's fantastic. Sounds like a, a well-rounded set of skills there and a powerful journey. And I like the double agent <laughs> comment. Um, so just given that then, because obviously it's taken you, as you say, all of that to get to where you are, what are you focusing on now? And can you tell us a little bit about that analysis and what you're do like what kind of insights you're doing in the sustainable investment space? Yeah, of course. It's really interesting, Amy, that even though we're here in 2022, if we think about the link between understanding how we invest our money and its impact on the world around us more holistically, really that sort of insight has, has still has many gaps, even though we've come a very, very long way and we stand on the shoulders of giants really today. So my areas of focus are, first of all, understanding how we integrate the best, most transparent, highest quality environmental, social and governance data into every area of the financial systems ecosystem. And what I mean by that is everything from you and me looking at our workplace pensions through to our financial advisors who are advising us on where we might want to uh, invest our money through to the asset managers who are constructing portfolios for us to buy or the asset owners who are looking at asset managers developing products for for uh, long-term investing. This is all about under, uh, understanding that the data that feeds into those decisions has to evolve. And the sort of technology that we have access to now means that we can do that. We can implement a growing set of ESG metrics with transparency into these investment decisions. And that's what we do at FNZ, specifically in the nature piece of this, it's been a challenge to understand how we shed light on the impact of our activities and company activities on nature. But now with the combination of data sets that we have available to us, including the ones developed by science, we've curated these data feeds from geospatial data through to scientific peer reviewed methodologies into one place, which means that we can start to fill the gap for understanding our impact on nature. And so that's also the second part, the research to be able to bring that kind of insight into the investment decision making ecosystem that we've discussed. Yeah, you basically touched on my next question there about what kind of data sets are being used. So you mentioned geospatial data because we often talk about um, you know, gaps in data, but I often think, well, what, what are the gaps? Which data are we missing? So can you kind of expand on that and just tell us a little bit more about how that's being used and what that's telling us about nature specifically so we can see where the impact is? A hundred percent, Amy. And it, we hear this a lot. You know, there's not enough data and it's challenging to attribute um, impact 
And these things are all true. But in some ways, it's not necessarily about having more data. It's sometimes about how we bring the data sources that we have together and curate them so that they become user-friendly. We don't expect asset managers to be biodiversity experts. They're already doing their best with what they have available to them. So what's coming together today, which is unique and which is why I think we can make a difference today, whereas before we couldn't, is that we have information on how different sectors affect biodiversity and natural capital. We have an understanding of what companies are doing in this space. So we we understand the reputational risks associated with companies' environmental impacts. So we have, to some extent, an idea of what companies are doing. But what we can add to that today, which is very new, is satellite data is unbelievable amounts of processing data when it comes to machine learning and natural language processing, which can now help us to bring together geospatial data sets, reported data sets and what companies are actually doing in terms of their emissions or their activities or their air pollution or their impact on the water use around them plus the insights we already had around the sorts of sectors they're operating in, the sorts of scientific data we have available in terms of our our impact on the world through certain activities. And it's the ability for technology to bring these data sets together that's so exciting because when you're looking at the impact of a company or an operation on nature, it's not just one thing. Even if we might want to make it one thing, it just It just isn't. It's a combination of holistic data sets, holistic inputs, which gives us a sense of how uh, this company potentially is impacting the world around it from a nature perspective. Absolutely. And I know, obviously, in terms of investment strategy, it's good to have that holistic vision of um, what a company is achieving and what the what the data says about nature and natural capital. Um, but when we look at this from a regulatory context, because I know sometimes the regulations can be quite prescriptive and there are these boxes to tick. What do you think the common data challenges are in this area and how can maybe some of these solutions kind of help asset managers, you know, meet the SFDR regulation or the US version or um, the UK's SDR, for example, that's coming into force? Yeah, a great question. I mean, when I first saw the SFDR, I thought, wow, of, of any of any piece of disclosure I've seen, and I always say the same thing about the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures when it comes into being, that is groundbreaking uh you know groundbreaking disclosures and so I, i'd probably say two things the first is that if we think about the obligations on investment managers in the finance sector you know, disclosure and the demands on companies to report are just going to rise and the technology that we have can support the ability to close the gaps where there is no disclosure today. But also, it, this is a, a time where these disclosures from companies are going to be really, really important. So I see that proliferating. Um, what I um, and what we're able to do now, you know, in fact, the first thing we did in Nature Alpha is say, how do we answer that question that SFDR asks? Are your company locations adjacent to or in protected areas and are they having a negative impact? It was a great place to start and we can answer that question at scale today, which is really very new. The one thing I would say though, is that disclosure by itself is not enough. Um, Just because we disclose, it doesn't mean that we're going to make improvements, but it's an amazing first step. What is crucial is that The finance industry works together with the companies in which they're invested and policymakers provide a direction and a a road of travel so that we understand that from where we are today, we need to get to this place. And I think that's where the regulation is going to help us move along that path. But it's going to require all of us to work together, really, to enable that positive transition to happen. 
Yeah, I completely agree. It shouldn't just be a tick box exercise. It should be a catalyst for change to just get them started and make them think about their long term strategy for sure. Um, I so think so, that- Amy. And oh, just sorry. on that point, it's sort of it's a lot for companies to think about too. How do we think about our impact on the climate? How do we think about our impact on nature? It, these are not easy things to start to think about, but increasingly the idea that there is a material risk associated with some of these issues and that it actually does factor into who you are as a business is becoming increasingly recognised by the market. And it's also about short, medium and long-term thinking. At what point will these things become material? And then that links into your values as a company. Does this matter to you? Are CEOs thinking about whether these long-term environmental and societal considerations are important to them in terms of their business as it evolves. Are they contributing to the solution or are they going to be part of the problem? And these are all issues that we're grappling with today. Yes, yeah, so speaking on company values then, can you tell us a little bit about your corporate sustainability programmes and what, what firms are doing and how you're helping them when it comes to things like diversity and inclusion and other values that we, I think we touch on the environmental a lot in this space, especially in Europe, but we often don't look at the bigger picture of what it means to have good values. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And even in the development of the sorts of tools that we've been bringing to market at FNZ where you're able, you and I are actually now able to understand some of those elements within the companies in which we're invested. So for example, we can show you the percentage of women on boards in the companies in which you're invested, as well as your environmental footprint. You know, it's very interesting to understand how important environmental and social considerations are for companies. It's increasingly becoming a factor in how companies are measured, how companies are valued. This is no longer a nice to have. It's something that's crucial for organizations to embrace. And it's not always easy because it involves complex practices. I don't know if you've ever tried to uh, put together a CDP or a, or a science-based targets uh, um, report, but you know, the simple act of trying to gather all of your energy bills is not, it's not an easy task. Also, understanding how diversity works in your organization when you're working between a number of different regulations in different countries. In some countries, you're not allowed to actually ask for certain uh, criteria or information on your, on your employees. How you support a diverse and inclusive environment is really, really important. And it also is just the start of the journey for many companies. It will become more and more important as our workforce and our employee expectations develop. So I would say watch this space. It's it's something that companies can no longer think about as a nice add-on. It's going to be crucial to how they do business in the future and how they encourage the next generation to want to work with them. Absolutely. It's more than just regulation. It's more about internal practices and kind of bigger policy questions that are still being shaped today. Um, I know there are a lot of voluntary frameworks out there. Like, for example, um, I was speaking with Mandy Kirby the other day on the channel and she was telling us about the ACT framework. And similarly, you know, you've um, been involved with the Benchmark for Nature framework at the University of Oxford. So could you touch on that a little bit and just tell us what that involves? Yeah, of course. I think that the link between business and science is crucial. But that those two worlds often don't speak the same language or that it's hard sometimes to translate the science into business practice. And so an example of where we've tried to build those bridges and link those communities is in the Benchmark for Nature project, which was catalyzed uh, at the Martin School through Professor E.J. Milner Gulland, um, who was one of my PhD co-supervisors, an incredible transdisciplinary thinker in the area of conservation and how we protect biodiversity and reach more positive outcomes. That's an example of a project where they're specifically thinking about how to use the science 
to understand and input into this question of how do we understand a company's impact on nature. It's one of many initiatives that are working in this space in the scientific field. I could also highlight IUCN, UNWCMC. These are organizations who have spent years developing their knowledge, rich, rich scientific knowledge on how we think about some of these issues and how we move that thinking to become a foundation for the work that we do in these areas across crucial issues like nature preservation. We, we can't just imagine that we can take one element, like for example, in the area of biodiversity, mean species abundance, and think that that's gonna be the silver bullet for understanding our impact and measuring our impact. It's one input. We have to understand that the scientific literature is broad and how we bring that into business to underpin what we set in place today, not just for the next three years or the next five years, but for the next 50 years, we have to make the right decisions today. And in many cases, the science has already thought about that. Think about the IPCC report or others. These are crucial areas that we're working in where the science has to underpin what we're doing. And that's really the point of initiatives like Benchmark for Nature, but also working very closely with the scientific community, whether it be at Oxford or Cambridge as we do, or other universities around the world. Yeah, you've touched on a good point there that, you know, you need people like yourself with the background in nature conservation, that element of science, financial strategy, business, it all kind of ties together. So I think we need a few more double agents in the industry to kind of propel this forward. There, um, are, there are quite a few. I find, find them quite <laughs> often. So yes, yeah. That's good. Well, I think it's heading in the right direction, but I'm excited to see how things progress as this picks up momentum. And I'm looking forward to having you speaking at our conference in November. So I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but thanks so much for joining thank you so much amy thanks very much and thanks everyone for watching